this is a long talk, and so I think I better call this order here. Are we recording? So, um, my subject is the mid 20th century Martinique and revolutionary intellectual friend fennel. Specifically, his last most widely circulated and most poorly read work, Les Dames à la Terre, or The Wretched of the Earth. Commonly regarded as simultaneously Marxist and anti Marxist, comprehension usually stops there. Uh, in general, this work is assimilated to Che Guevara, Chairman Mao, etc. It's a classic of third worldism, supposedly. The work is considered both revolutionary and socialist, while yet breaking with central assumptions or doctrines of Marxism, most obviously the necessity of proletarian leadership. But what this misses is Fanon's underlying assumption that there is no Marxism to espouse or reject. That is, Fanon understood that, at least for his entire adult life, Marxism was dead. It had denied a double death in the period of the Great Wars, 1914 to 1945. He understood that, that internationalist socialism was fascism's main enemy alongside the Jews. Indeed, the two were conflated as both representing internationalism and the Nazi propaganda image of the Jewish Bolshevik. The first Nazi concentration camp opened at Dachau in March 1933 to imprison the regime's political opponents, and its first 100 prisoners were communists. As Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer remarked of the Nazi terror in 1942, the workers are the real target, but are not told as much to their faces. The blacks must be kept in their place. The Jews are to be wiped from the face of the earth. The consolidation of the Nazis' grip on Germany, and especially the wartime state terror regime, eliminated the largest working class parties for socialism that ever existed in the industrial capitalist world, the two legacies the old German Social Democratic Party, the Social Democratic Party, and the Communist Party. The occupation of Poland, France, the Netherlands, etc., spelled the doom for the socialism of those countries, just as Franco and Mussolini's governments did for Spanish and Italian socialism. The consolidation of the fascist domination of Europe and the war did not just mean a holocaust for Jews. From a left historical perspective, it meant the decimation of the epicenter of the international socialist movement as inherited from the 19th century. As Horkheimer and Adorno's allusion to the blacks indicates, this was of no merely local significance. Fanon's entire intellectual project grows out of the historical consciousness underlying Adorno and Horkheimer's statements. He was coming, he, Fanon was aware that he was coming of age in the aftermath of European freedom. But of course, he didn't learn that from the Frankfurt School. Fanon gained his sense of the crisis of history from, first of all, the lived experience his interpreters talk so much about, yet so poorly understand. But he also processed that experience through a close engagement with Jean-Paul Sartre, Maurice Aurelio Ponty, and the wider Le Don Modern circle of the 1940s. As Sartre, the author with whom Fanon was most closely engaged, explained in Anti-Semite and Jew Reflexion sur la question juive, so the English translation is a little weird. The text, as you can see, is reflections on the Jewish question. Race consciousness lingered despite fascism's defeat. And this was telling for Sartre. Writing of the Jews of Europe in 1945-46, Sartre observed that they could not but abandon assimilation and think of themselves as Jews. Because the anti-Semite 
has put them in the situation of a Jew. He added, the Jew simply renounces for himself an, assimil an assimilation that is today impossible. He awaits the radical liquidation of anti-Semitism for his sons. <coughs> Underlying this was the recognition that, in another but elusive sense, socialism had somehow conspired in its own defeat, indeed had defeated itself. It was not only Hitler's enemy, but his best ally. One did not have to be a Trotskyist, leaving aside what that meant after World War II, without the overthrow of the Stalinist regime or the renewal of socialism to grasp communism's utter bankruptcy. That had been plainly expressed by its failure to avert fascism and catastrophe across the continent. And the question of, the, of communism's failure roiled within the intellectual circles with which Fedon was engaged. Nor was this question confined to anti-Stalinism. Would be leftist intellectuals were no less disappointed by the new social democracy as the French Socialist Party surrendered all pretense of representing anything other than an alternative policy for the management of capitalism. In either case, whether in the form of the revisionism embraced by the socialists or the revisionism expressed by the PCF, the Communist Party of France, and more generally by the Stalinization and the liquidation of the common term, the left betrayed itself in and through its assimilation to anti-fascist progress. In this sense, the Allied powers defeated not fascism, but the Axis powers. Allied anti-fascism served only as self-justification, and Allied anti-fascism is, the, as it were, the foundation of French socialism and the French Communist Party of 1945. As Aimé Césaire, Fenon's other key influence in this period, wrote in 1950 in lines that Fenon quotes in Black Skin, White Masks, when I turn on my radio, when I hear that Negroes have been lynched in America, I say that we have been lied to, Hitler is not dead. When I turn on my radio, when I hear that Jews have been insulted, mistreated, persecuted, I say that we have been lied to, Hitler is not dead. When finally I turn on my radio and hear that in Africa, forced labor has been inaugurated and legalized, I say that we have certainly been lied to, Hitler is not dead. And the persistence, or rather reconstitution, of the French Empire in Vietnam and in Algeria exemplified this. On Victory in Europe Day, in 1945, Fanon, a decorated soldier in the Free French Army, was about to turn 20 years old. Even as the victory of, of, over fascism was everywhere being celebrated, the political failure of Europe was unmistakably evident. The stench was unmistakable. Fanon had made great efforts to get himself into the anti-fascist war, in which he believed the legacy of 1789 to be fundamentally at stake, as undoubtedly it was. But by January 1945, it was clear to him that the fight against fascism was no revolution. As he wrote to his brother back in Martinique, I have been deceived and I am now paying for my mistakes. An immense ideological effort is required over, has been required over the past three quarters of a century to evade the full implications of the fact that mid-century decolonization movements were fundamentally conditioned by World War II and the defeat of the left. By World War II, I mean the consolidation of the defeat of socialism across Europe. Not only mainstream communism, but seemingly dissident strands of Marxism as, as well avoided confrontation with 
the desolation of world history. And they did so among other, in, in among other ways by distorting the question of decolonization. It, and it was decolonization, of course, that dominated Frank Fanon's concerns. In the case of the French Empire, many colonial regimes, like that of Robert in Fanon's own Martinique, a government that was overthrown in Martinique in 1943, and that of Algeria sided with the collaborationist Vichy regime. During the war, free France preserved the empire from fascism or liberated colonial territories from fascism. Indeed, such was the colonial policy, so to speak, of communists fighting the people's war. In other words, the people's war meant defending the European imperial states that were allied against the Axis. Like the necessity, as Sartre put it, oh, wait, I'm sorry, after the war was over, communism supported French imperialism as, guess what, a bulwark against American imperialism. Like the necessity, as Sartre put it, of the assertion of Jewish and black identity in the face of fascism and its false defeat, decolonization movements are symptoms of socialism's defeat. The anti-imperialist revolution, as opposed to mere decolonization, was launched in the 1950s. In 1954, Vietnamese forces under General Job defeated the French army at Dien Bien Phu, and the Algerian War of Independence began. The following year, the Non-Aligned Movement was formally founded at Bandung, Indonesia. In 1956, Khrushchev, of course, delivered his secret speech on Stalin's crimes. There was an uprising in Hungary against the communist regime, and the US blocked Israel, Britain, and France from taking over the Suez Canal in Egypt. In 1957, Ghana emerges as the first sub-Saharan African country to gain its independence, and in 1960, the decolonization of Africa reaches a kind of high point with the independence of Togoland, the Congo, Mali, Senegal, and Nigeria, among many other countries. That was the so-called Year of Africa. Tanganyika, Rwanda, Kenya, and of course Algeria would soon follow in the early 1960s. This is the immediate background for Fanon's writing, The Wretched of the Earth. Shortly, shortly before the end of the war, a 19-year-old French Fanon wrote to his parents, I've lost confidence in everything, even myself. If I don't come back, he's writing, talking about getting ready to take part in another offensive thing in, in the, uh, he's in northern France, driving, you know, leading up to the Battle of Bulge. He says, if I don't come back, and if one day you should learn that I die facing the enemy, console each other, but never say, he died for the good cause. Simply say, God called him back. The Europe that Fanon fought to defend was abandoned even before he had arrived on its soil. The anti-fascism of the Atlantic Charter and the Stalin Soviet Union was, as he said, false. It was an ideology that served only to shield the secularist and idiot politicians. It must not, as he wrote, delude us any longer. Fighting to free France, he concluded, was wrong. In The Wretched of the Earth, perhaps even more than in his youthful masterpiece, Black Skin, White Masks, Fanon deepened his recognition that he, re that he reports to his parents in 1945. And of course, a month later, French forces celebrated Victor in Europe Day on the very day 
by slaughtering 20,000 Algerians at Sekif, who thought that the end of the war meant their emancipation. Social democracy and communism self-defense and the resulting collapse of Europe into fascism was not reversed by fascism's, fascism's defeat. The Americans and Soviets won the war, but freedom lay in ruins. This is Fanon's context. An important new study of Fanon by the Marxist humanist Peter Hudis argues that Franz Fanon's achievement is positive, that he supplies the missing piece in Marxism. Supposedly arguing for the replacement of an older, inadequate, because hypocritical, humanism, which is somehow white and imperialistic, Hudis celebrates Fanon for a supposed paradigm shift which he affects by giving a sociogenic account of race and racism and an authentically Marxist account of colonialism. Underpinning this is the assumption that one, Fanon rejects the ideals of the Enlightenment, ideals that he has imbibed from his youth, reading for long hours the classics of the French Enlightenment in the Bibliothèque Chaucher in Fort de France, two, the bourgeois ideology going back at least to the writings of Rousseau, had not in fact already provided a sociogenic account of all civil inequality, and three, that there was something inherently inadequate about the socialist legacy that insisted not on social equality between races, or for that matter, between tribes, religions, and subnationalities. No more insisting that blacks and whites be friends than that Jews and Gentiles get married, uh, but insisted instead upon political and economic equality, adding that he who denies this to any other human being is unfit for it himself. So socialism demanded political and economic equality. That's, these are quotes from Eugene Debs. And simply understood that anyone who doesn't recognize that is unfit for such equality themselves, but didn't insist that you not be racist and be a socialist, or that you not have any prejudice, right? That the only question was, do you agree on political equality? It's the same liberal point, by the way, that's in, made in the Lincoln film, right? In the, in the speech by Thaddeus Stevens, uh, who nicely turns the point around and says, you know, how can I believe that people are equal when I'm dealing with like a bunch of racists and counter-revolutionaries right, uh, who are obviously despicable people. After World War I, when European socialism entered into crisis, but especially after World War II, when the European project lay in ruins, the old impulse of pre-World War I colonized intellectuals to hang their hopes on and to participate in, in whatever way is available to them, the march of European socialism no longer sufficed. Prior to World War I, intellectuals amongst colonized peoples were, of course, subject to forms of tyranny, exploitation, degradation, insult, etc. But by acquiescing in them, uh, which is to say, by not launching any imperialist movements prior to World War I. They were neither naive nor cowardly. Fanon saw that post-war decolonization was being won through the struggles of millions in the colonized world and engages with that. Just as in his psychiatric practice, Fanon was always, always ready to engage with madness, so too for him politically, the onus is always on the present moment. Indeed, from his psychiatric and psychoanalytic studies, Fanon drew a vocabulary to express what Peter Hudis' essentially positive approach fundamentally misprizes, namely, the regressive character of the post-socialist world, which persists down to the present day. Hudis implies that the failure of the revolution was rooted in the unripeness of the world and presumably of Marxism for socialism 
that it therefore needs to be supplemented, that we need to have an account of a Marxist account of racialization, et cetera, et cetera. As he asks, where before Franz Fanon is the Marxist theory of racialization? But Fanon recognized his world as overripe for socialism, indeed as rotten, distorted, and misshapen, not only by capitalism, but by socialism's failure. This means that he grasped the Algerian war for independence and the wider decolonization of Africa in the wretched of the earth, not in simple terms of a dialectic of world revolution, but as grasping that dialectic as trapped in what Sartre in his analysis of anti-Semitism termed Manichaeanism. Fanon extends this to treat the dialectic of the world revolution as blocked. As for Fanon's exposure to more straightforwardly political expressions of the leftist critique of Stalinism during the period of his involvement with the War of Algerian Independence, his comrade Alice Shevki notes that at the crucial moment when he quit his work as a psychiatrist at a hospital in Algiers, or just outside of Algiers, in 1956, he stayed for weeks at the home of his friend Jean N. Cherki observes, the reading materials that AIM had given him included the transcripts and published at the time of the first four congresses of the Communist International, adding that these documents had a special fascination for Fanon and they accompanied, accompanied him through long nights. She elaborates that Fanon during this period of semi-retirement, this is between quitting his job as a psychiatrist and joining full-blown uh, the FLN as a writer for their newspaper, El Mujan, in, um, in exile in Morocco. In this period of semi-retirement, was free to indulge in marathon discussions of the kind that had always been so dear to his heart. Aim, who was a seasoned Trotskyist, realized that Fanon, for all his erudition, was basically politically uninformed, especially as regards Algerian nationalism and its various leanings and factions, unquote. Fanon at this time went out of his way to meet and talk in Ames company and also to join in conversations with other young French Trotsky assistants, the historian Pierre Fouet. So he was by no means unaware of the critique of uh, the course of the revolution and of the Stalinization of the colony. Originally, at the time of the common terms drafting of the national and colonial theses in 1920, the idea had been that the anti-colonial revolution would complement and be complemented by a ongoing or stalled but soon to be renewed European revolution. After 1945, the modern revolution was dead in the industrial core of world capitalism, and yet national liberation struggles raged in the colonial periphery. In this sense, the wretched of the earth is a kind of meditation on progress within an overarching process of historical decay and regression. In it, Fanon theorized the simultaneous necessity and impossibility of an international revolution in the age of decolonization. What he writes is a historical phenomenology of revolutionary stasis, of progress in regression, and regression through progress. The question that the wretched of the earth asks is not how the third world revolution might succeed, because he knows this to be impossible, but how it could contribute to a project that Fanon identifies over and over again negatively by its absence and by the distorting effects of that absence, namely the recovery of world socialist revolution, without which decolonization could not succeed even in bringing about a 1789-style revolution. In this sense, his attempt, his is an attempt to work through the catastrophe of the 20th century from within the seemingly futile anti-colonial struggle. 
But for Peter Hudis, and as for so many other commentators, Fenon's project of third world revolution was, and was supposedly thought by Fenon himself, to be coherent. They speak of going beyond the bourgeois democratic stage of the anti-colonial revolution and the like, actively mystifying the fact that first world bourgeois democracy is neither bourgeois nor democratic, and there is no bourgeois democratic stage of a revolution in the third world. Yet somehow, Fanon must be relevant, if not in Africa, then in the anti-racist struggle. Fanon is celebrated most actually for his 1960s black nationalist perception, when supposedly, according to Eldridge Cleaver, every brother on a rooftop could quote Fanon. Fanon is relevant because he's irrelevant because he anticipates today's identity political and abolitionist movements. He's an OG. But the actual connection between today's world and the world in which Fanon wrote is far more tenuous, more recursively regressive than this narrative could, could imply, not least because it ignores or maintains a discrete silence respecting the faith post-colonial countries. The Fanon literature is terrible, but Fanon commentator Achille Mbembe does, has recently remarked upon the persistence or even ubiquity in our time in a context of discussing Fanon, of demagogic democracy, expansive police powers, and war in the developing world. As he remarks, we are living today to a planetary scale renewal of the relation of enmity. For Mbembe, for whom at least Fanon remains a theorist of the third world, the nature or origin of such a relation of enmity is, alas, unspecified. Still, he does grasp that our connection to Fanon is less in terms of a progress of common struggle than of the persistence of terror and atrocity. Those are his words. Because I'm a South Asianist, I will highlight the descent of decolonization into terror and atrocity with respect to that region of the world, a region whose population is just shy of that of North America, South America, and Africa combined. Taking the news from South Asia in recent years, we see dramatically posed the advanced crisis of the post-colonial so-called revolution. In India, since the consolidation of Hindutva brought on by the re-election of Prime Minister Modi in 2019, there's been a steady ratcheting up of the Hindu ethno-state project. Using public health as a pretense, Lockdown was imposed on Delhi in March of 2020 in a naked bid to disperse with police clubs the, the protests against the National Registry of Citizens and the Citizen Amendment Act, Citizenship Amendment Act, which taken together menace hundreds of millions of poor Indian Muslims with the loss of citizenship there. Again, in the name of COVID, the force of the state and the paramilitary organizations were unleashed on the poor, driving them from the streets, forcing them to return to their villages in their hundreds of thousands, often on foot, producing the underreported but dreadful spectacle of poor families, often without adequate food and water, walking hundreds of kilometers to their natal villages. And finally, to stick with the pandemic, in the provision of health care, the staggering inequality of South Asian society was on stark display when, in the spring of 2021, the Delta variant slammed that region. People died on the streets and on the sidewalks, outside of hospitals and in hospital corridors, black markets and hospital in oxygen tanks, hospital beds, and medical supplies sprang up, and makeshift cremation grounds overflowed despite operating day and night with scarcely time allowed for the performance of the last rites. 
as the number of infections rose above, above 400,000 per day, undoubtedly a vast underestimate, the government actively suppressed adverse news coverage. The general pattern, always present but entrenched since Modi's in, in election, grew more pronounced. The whole of the Indian media, once amongst the more vibrant in the underdeveloped world, has become fully coordinated with the state. I don't enter into the innumerable instances of the intimidation and outright murder of journalists and intellectuals, many of whom are my friends. In Pakistan, years of rank political corruption and tacit, sometimes tacit, sometimes overt military rule have in recent months revealed their re results this summer in the conceivably horrific reports of death and displacement occasioned by the massive flooding there. A population equivalent to that of Canada has been rendered homeless as dengue fever and other diseases arising from unsanitary conditions, inadequate shelter, crop destruction, the devastation of livestock, and the tanking of wells vastly outstrips the death and injury caused by the floods themselves. The state is in every way inadequate to this crisis, there as elsewhere. This, of course, will only provide more recruits to Islamist parties and organizations whose strength in the country has intensified since the recent Taliban victory of the United States in neighboring Afghanistan. An entry long to the food crisis now menacing the poor around the world drove a desperate populace to overthrow the government a few months ago. Yet it's entirely unclear that what political alternative there is to the stagnancy and corruption of the status quo. Such is the political crisis afflicting the post-colonial world as briefly exemplified in recent news in South Asia. Underlying it, of course, is deeply entrenched poverty, which if defined as household incomes of less than 550 per day, afflicts 1.5 billion people in the region as compared to 936 million in Africa, 82.4% and 86.8% respectively for the two world regions according to the latest World Bank data. As the post-colonial world thus crab walks into the new post-neoliberal age, even the painfully slow trends of recent decades towards decreasing poverty and increasing lifespans, which is what characterized the neoliberal period. Trends that were themselves largely unaccompanied by prospects of genuine social participation, much less individual flourishing, are today threatened with outright reversal. There was no such thing as the third world revolution. As conditions in South Asia demonstrate the anti-imperialist revolution lies in ruins, even as most of the region celebrates the 75th anniversary of independence. Fanon's Ofer project, the project with which, with which he's identified, the anti-colonial revolution, the third world revolution, is dead. If it ever existed, whatever prospects it may have had but long since faded. And when did this become clear? a very long time ago. By 1988, in 1988, Fanon's widow, Josie, took her own life, having washed a few months before from the balcony of her flat in Algiers as young men torched police cars in the streets, only to face, in turn, the sort of murderous police brutality that had characterized French colonialism. She watched as, below her window, hundreds of people were killed on the streets. After seeing the crackdown, she wrote to a friend, oh, France, the wretched of the earth. And at least her, and at least her suicide spared her from having to witness La Salle Guerre, or the dirty war of 1991 to 2002 between the Algerian state and Islamist forces. Doubtless, she had already seen more than enough. After all, she lived to see the complete degeneration of post-war national liberation struggles. In Iran, the overthrow of the Shah a decade before had led not to radical change, but to Khomeini's consolidation of power and the wholesale detention and extermination of the left. The same point 
illustrated ad nauseum with respect to other cases. So the utter bankruptcy of post-war anti-imperialism has been abundantly clear for many decades to anyone who bothers to inquire. Indeed, it arguably was clear to Fanon in 1961, though he and Josie then still hoped to discover how it might point beyond itself. Though the bankruptcy of the New World, of the Third World Revolution, is not a secret, the left has refused to draw any lessons from it, indeed, to acknowledge it. And why would it? Already in the 1960s, as Fanon foresaw and as only grew more pronounced over the course of the decade, anti-imperialism and black nationalism served as more of an avoidance, as an avoidance strategy than as any viable political program or even any route to any viable political program for the metropolitan left. In the US and Europe, but not only there, Sympathy or solidarity with those struggling against American imperialism, pre preferably non-white, preferably with gun in hand, became the dominant means by which all recognition of the crisis occasioned by the death of revolutionary socialism was repressed, at least as regards the fate of the rest of the world. Until recently, anti-imperialism was the dominant means whereby the metropolitan left convinced itself that la lutte continue, the struggle continues. Revolutionary <coughs> heroes in faraway lands were lionized by college radicals who could never crack the enigma of how to reboot the left at home. Thus, what captured, or indeed rather overwhelmed, the imagination of the American new left, where, in fact, Fennel has had his greatest reception. As the prospect of creating a genuinely new left definitively receded after the civil rights movement crested in 1964-65, the way in which that imagination, um, what, what captured that imagination after the cresting of the possibilities of genuinely, of genuinely creating a new left the way that that was suppressed was through the opposition to the Vietnam War. Chanting Ho, Ho, Ho Chi Minh, the NLF is going to win, and striking radical poses was much easier than figuring out what Fanon, his books, above all, Wretched of the Earth, now converted into a kind of talisman, actually demanded of the Western left. Because that, would, that required figuring out how to actually build leftist parties that could claim the mantle of the mass working class parties for socialism of the past. Later, in my generation, Generation X, the same thing was repeated on a more degraded level with respect to Nicaraguan and Palestinian solidarity. The point, of course, is not that such struggle should be ignored or that you know, there's, there's no prospect or no one cares or whatever, but that anti-imperial solidarity was a means by which to abdicate solidarity by suppressing the recognition of the actual historical crisis faced around the world. The old post-left post anti-imperialism reappeared for the last time, perhaps, at the dawn of the millennial left, which first formed itself in the early 2000s in, in opposition to the Iraq war. But beyond opposition to the war, the question of geopolitics in the absence of mass working class movements for international socialism in the core of capitalism, again, once again, and perhaps for the first time, for the, perhaps for the last time, confounded the left. So much so that by the time the millennial left resolved itself definitively back into the Democratic Party in 2016, questions of internationalism simply ceased to be posed. Today, the politicians on which the left pins their hopes, like Bernie Sanders and AOC, simply don't talk about geopolitics, or indeed the global south. They stay focused exclusively on domestic questions. Meanwhile, the ghosts of World War II grow more menacing than ever, as the lights, quite literally, are set to go out in Europe this winter, and Putin summons 
his last reserves in defiance of NATO. The left would rather not think about it because it so plainly expresses, as does the fate of the third world, their historical helplessness. Failing to truly come to terms with the Iranian Revolution or Joseph Fanon's recognition of the rottenness of the Algerian Revolution, the left persists with actionist anti-imperialism. It persisted with actionist anti-imperialism to the point of making, having positions on the internal politics of countries about which most leftists, especially young leftists, know nothing, a kind of litmus test. Until finally, with the, mil with the millennial left, the project just grew exhausted. The American left, through its avowed support for the Democrats, its acquiescence in Russia Gate, has surrendered reason as, as the price of an ever elusive universal health care. Today, idealistic young people concerned with the world beyond their borders are as likely to sign on with the newly woke intelligence and military agencies as they are to contemplate forming independent left, in fact, far more likely. In short, for the millennials, as for the new left, so-called anti-imperialism failed to accomplish what Fanon attempted to make of it, an occasion for the recovery of historical consciousness. Now, to further liquidate that historical consciousness, anti-imperialism is unceremoniously abandoned in favor of an anti-fascism backed by Wall Street and enforced by the FBI. Ignor ignoring Fennel's critique of anti-imperialism, conditioned and betrayed by anti-fascism, the left now simply tacks between them, accomplishing in the process a new fascist anti-fascism, a new racist anti-racism, to complement the neo-fascist anti-imperialism of Islamism in Dutva and Putin. What the great Martinican revolutionary called the unrelenting dialectic of post-socialist capitalism, the post-left whirligate of unfreedom, continues to bring in its revenges. Fanon is almost invariably read as saying the struggle continues, or as the Black Agenda report puts it, Fanon's contributions are timeless. In this way, Fanon is read as affirmative of the course of history, itself viewed as culminating in the third world and anti-racist revolutions. He is misportrayed as a cheerleader, the most militant militant of the third world revolution. This is certainly how he is marketed. In Hollywood's most recent revolutionary soap opera, Judas and the Black Messiah, presumptively revolutionary black prisoners are said to be reading Fanon. The same cliche that every black prisoner is a Fanon steeped George Jackson is likewise depicted in the 1993 cult classic Blood In, Blood Out. Reading Fanon, specifically Wretched of the Earth, is a kind of new left ritual because Fanon's rhetoric is that of the Third World Revolution. And it is true, Fanon's critique is only, as it were, sparingly flagged, existing as it does at the level of the unfolding of the argument. When I first read my uncle's copy of the book, when I was 15 years old, living with him in Ramallah, in Israeli-occupied Palestine, that country was on the brink of the first intifada. The cover of my uncle's old 1968 paperback described Wretched of the Earth as, quote, the handbook for the black revolution that is changing the shape of the world. But there's another Fanon, another Wretched of the Earth, one not found on the cover, but in the pages themselves, read difficultly, with earnest, earnestly, not as a ritual. Only in those pages, must, those pages, which are so full of violent overthrow, 
have to be recognized as critically specifying a crisis. It is no sort of handbook, no sort of program. What the new left reception misses is Fanon's critique of the failure of Eurocentric socialism. Isn't it? It's not a criticism of Eurocentrism, it's a criticism of the failure of European freedom. This is remarkable in itself, given that the very title of the text is drawn from the first line of the international in French. For Fanon, I'm sorry, not the first international, the, the, the second international, right? The song, the international. For Fanon, that was the only viable project of socialism that ever existed. So when he laments in Wretched of the Earth that the European game is finally over, he substitutes in its place no alternative project of historical emancipation. As even the relatively rotten commentator Bankaj Mishra has recently observed, Fanon is obsessed with the curse of independence, the possibility that nationhood in the global south is only an empty shell, a receptacle for ethnic and tribal nationalisms, ultranationalisms, chauvinism, and indeed racism. For Fanon, the devastation wrought by fascism and war, and more fundamentally, collapse of European socialism after World War II casts its baleful shadow over the entire world. So Fanon's project is not what it seems. It's a negative dialectical appropriation of the Third World Revolution, outlining, analyzing, lamenting, ultimately critiquing the impossibility of world revolution after the failure of European revolution. For Fanon, even the crimes, even the slavery in which Europe held four-fifths of humanity might have been justified in the name of the European spirit. These are all quotes. Had that spirit been historically realized and overcome in world socialism? For, as he avers, all the elements for the solution of the major problems of humanity exist in one way or another in European thought. Up to the crisis of European socialism, as I have argued, colonial peoples were not asleep. They participated in the spirit of freedom that they saw unfolding behind and through world historic appearances of European power and indeed European conquest and rule. Of course, there was resistance to imperialism, but it was as often as not conservative before World War I and wholly inadequate, certainly, to the creation of a new society emanating from the colonial cities. This would be perhaps most deeply reflected upon by Marx in his reflections on the, um, the Indian mutiny of, of 1857. Not until after World War I did the new urban English and French speaking educated classes begin to lead a resistance to imperialism. Many of them believing that, that, would, that they were taking part in the still unfolding global October Revolution. Though even in India, where post-war anti-imperialism was strongest, it didn't really take off until 1920. Lenin had put the entire matter this way in that year. The Communist International's entire policy on the national and colonial questions should rest primarily on a closer union of the proletarians and the working masses of all nations and countries for a joint revolutionary struggle to overthrow the landowners and the bourgeoisie. This union alone will guarantee victory over capitalism without which the abolition of national oppression and inequality is impossible. But that closer union was never achieved. At any event, 
question-facing intellectuals in the colonies uh, what was always as it always had been, whether the bourgeois spirit might overcome its own crisis. For the rise of socialism was not separate from, but lay at the heart of the global imperial state order, and not due to any political compromises on the part of socialists. In this sense, there's no more imperialism but only neo-colonialism in our world because there's no socialist workers movement in the core of capitalism. And in its unmastered self-contradiction, as Fanal says, the modern revolution gained a mad momentum that eventually, such that it eventually lost control and lost reason as it went, quote, hurtling towards the brain. As he says, there had been Marxism. It had urged the European workers to smash capitalism's narcissism. Again, Fanon's always drawing on the language of psychiatry and psychoanalysis to try to develop, a, as it were, negative dialectic. But in the period from the outbreak of World War I to Hitler's succession to power, quote, European workers, in the end, failed to respond to revolutionary Marxism's call, unquote. Instead, the workers succumbed to capitalism, to the dialectic self-consumption, thinking that, quote, they too were part of the prodigious adventure of the European spirit, unquote. In response to socialism's betrayal, or was it the other way around? The working class betrayed the socialist revolution, which in order to fulfill bourgeois society would have had to realize by breaking with its spirit. Decolonization was, in this crucial sense, the product of a dire and unprecedented situation. Focus on the shift from British to American hegemony, much less celebration decolonization as progress only flattens and affirms the regression. Fascism for Fanon, as it had been for Césaire, served as the testament, testamentary executor of the defeat of socialism. Quote, Europeans did not act on the mission that was designated for them and that consisted in taking the problem of man to an infinitely higher plane than had hitherto been possible. No matter the post-war wealth then beginning to reveal itself under the leadership of that monster, the United States, now, for Fanon, the West promised nothing but stasis. The post-war world was one of stagnation, where dialectics has turned into its opposite, the logic of the status quo. Unquote. Fanon's Third World Revolution, his National Liberation Revolution, his embrace of violence and indeed of, in, of irrationalism are not in fact affirmative but critical. Fanon tried to distill from the experience of Kenya, of Congo, of Ghana, of South Africa, and of Madagascar, a phenomenology of the betrayed revolution, one that offered no solution one that could arrive at no program, but nevertheless poignantly underscored and thus potentially helped to overcome a historical impasse. His acceptance of responsibility for the struggle of his time demanded that he refuse to turn away from the barbarism, violence, directionlessness, and indeed helplessness to which the failure of European socialism had confined the revolution in the post-war Cuban, Chinese, and Vietnam, the Chinese, Cuban, and Vietnamese revolutions notwithstanding. What his post revolutionary, revolutionary phenomenology suggested was that, in the absence of the renewal of the left in the core of capitalism, a new sort of highly volatile and demagogic post colonial democracy would come to grip the entire post colonial world. 
in the year 2022, we're far away from Fennel's world. If he were alive today, he would be 97. When he wrote Wretched, he was as close to the time of the Spanish-American War, the Boer War, and the revisionist dispute within Marxism as we are to him now. But this obscures something even more essential. For the time that extends between us and Fanon is, so to speak, merely generational. That is, at least as regards the revolutionary politics to which he was, in, to, to which he was committed, even if it was impossible for him to participate in it. It has been political stagnation and regression ever since his death, indeed, ever since his coming to maturity. As my brief review of anti-imperialist pseudo-politics was meant to suggest, history has been canceled. And because nothing happens, at least nothing in the way of prosecuting the task of world socialism, in this sense, Fanon remains our contemporary. This despite the immense changes that separate us, not least of which is this, that Fanon knew, whereas the left today suppresses the recognition that history has collapsed. He knew what we forgot, and then all the rest of the earth is necessary today only because its affirmative misreadings helped to obscure the very condition it was trying to identify. To conclude then these very preliminary remarks, Fennel fully recognized the truth of what Sartre wrote in The Search for a Method, published just a few years before Rich of the Earth, namely that anti-Marxist argument can only be a rejuvenation of a pre-Marxist idea. Any so-called going beyond Marxism will only at worst be a return to pre-Marxism, at best only the rediscovery of a thought already contained in the philosophy that it believes to have gone beyond." Unquote. Given this, the project of the third world, that all asserted, was to try to, serve, to solve the problem that this Europe was incapable of finding the answers to. But the problems that needed, answer, needed answering were the same. Like the European Revolution since 1848, the Third World Revolution was conditioned by defeat. Yet he summoned the people of Africa and the non-West generally to look elsewhere besides Europe as a deliberate self-contradiction. Hence, in his conclusion, he says, for Europe, for ourselves, and for our humanity, and for humanity, comrades, we must make a new start. Marxism, to address the age of post-revolutionary decolonization, would have to be, as he famously said, slightly stretched, precisely in order to recover itself or to make itself issue into something genuinely new and worthy of its legacy. For no one knew better than the supposedly anti-proletarian Fanon that failing the return to proletarian socialism, any attempt at recovering history was likely doomed from the start. The underdeveloped world, at a very fundamental level, as he reiterates time and again in Rich of the Earth, desperately requires capital. And there's no alternative than to seeking capital from the West. And every consequence following from that fact must be drawn. The struggles of the third world, the struggle of the third world was thus only to repose the question for which Europe had already supplied the elements of a solution. That's our problem too. Mm -hmm.
trying to indicate broadly is that um, you know, Fanon has a couple of views. He really has three sources for his thought, right? In as much as they are like of his time. You know, he's a widely read guy, he knows a lot. But what does he study, understand, what informs, what does he rework in the writing from you know his adult life, which of course was a very brief life. Um, he has, as I indicated, like these Parisian intellectuals around the Sartre circle, the, which is expressed in a magazine called Modern Times, La Temps Moderne. Uh, people like Simone de Beauvoir uh, and others, the American Richard Wright, lots of people write in that journal. Um, he has Aimé Césaire, who was his teacher in Martinique. Uh, the brilliant uh, Martinian poet and later politician. And he has his training in psychiatry. And the psychiatry that he's trained in is a, you know, it, it's, he's not trained in or doesn't really have access to anything that we might recognize as like orthodox psychoanalysis. It's, psychoanalysis is barely even really sort of registering in France at that time, though he reads deeply in it. Um, what he's trying to get at is, you know, question of, you know, questions of regression. You know, the most fundamental regression that I'm trying to point out is the very confrontation with race, right, that Sartre talks about in terms of anti-Semitism. Right, that like, like that Jews are forced to be Jews, blacks are forced to be black people, that this is a crisis, this is a symptom of regression, the whole posing of the question is a problem. Right, that it's not that, it's not that Marxism had, as it were, neglected those questions, it's that Marxism had advanced beyond the, you know, it, it, it it pushed a revolution that would not have to face those regressions. These problems are only being posed as a result of the failure of the left. I think that Fanon is, you know, in, in Black Skin White Masks, it's more explicit, because that book is much more openly psychoanalytic, um, or has, you know, I mean, that book, I guess, is exemplary of Fanon. If you know that book, it's like super eclectic, right? He just, he waxes poetic, right? He writes like a philosopher. Sometimes you feel like you're reading like a Merleau Ponty. Sometimes you feel like you're reading um, some kind of, you know, negritude poetry. He, you know, sometimes you feel like you're reading like a budding novelist, right? He, there's a lot of narrative in that book. Uh, it's it's very um, unique that way, and I would say that you know rather than trying to sort of look to Fanon to say like see he's got like you know he, he's got a reading of psychoanalysis that's you know he's drawing straight from Wilhelm Reich or drawing straight from you know the Frankfurt School or something like that he doesn't have those resources available. But what he does is he forces the resources that are available to him to identify the problem that he wants to get at, right? And it's, you know, I guess what I'm trying to exemplify for members of Platypus is to learn how to read people who may not be as sort of like explicit and like use categories in the way that you're familiar with, but rather like read the aspiration within it and see the way that the language is being like refashioned by a brilliant creative writer to just make it say what he wants it to say, right? And so he just, when he talks about dialectics, and he keeps on talking about dialectics being blocked or the dialectic being narcissistic or the dialectic like falling into Manichaeanism, right? He'll just draw categories 
from wherever he can to talk about um, a crisis. And, and when he writes the phenomenology of, you know, which is really just a set of kind of random chapters uh, that can be read in, you know, I think different orders, if you, know, if you like. Um, the rest of the earth is like a super coherent book. You know, he narrates on basically his death that he died in leukemia. What he's constantly doing is sort of narrating like phases of anti-colonial revolution. Right? This one might be more based on Madagascar, or this part might be more based on the experience of the Congo, or this part might be more based on what he was most familiar with the Algerian experience. But each one like, arrives in a crisis. Right? He'll say, oh, the working class isn't revolutionary. The peasants are revolutionary. He'll like, voice like all the Maoism and all the rotten leftism of his day. Right? Only to show how like, it deepens the problem. And then he'll get back to the question of the crisis and dialectic. Right? That's why I mean, it never arrives at like, and this is how we achieve the third world revolution. Like that moment, which is constantly attributed to Fennel, is never there. Um, you know, I guess I would say that, um, you know, to come back to your question on you know, straightforwardly, Fennel is interesting also as a doctor, as a psychiatrist. He looks a lot to me like a lot of post-war psychiatry. You know, he's interested in taking the shackles off the prisoners. He's interested in socialization of prisoners. He's a reformer of hospital practices, or he's a participant in a wider reform movement within French psychiatry to reform hospital practices. I was talking with uh, Jamie about this last night. I don't know if Jamie's here. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, but does he have like he's not you know he's and he's not like falling into like Lacanianism, you know, he quotes Lacan and people were trying to like assimilate into that. He just thinks of Lacan as like another guy in France who writes own psychology. He doesn't make us anything particularly special. Um, he just quotes it as a scientific paper. So I would say that he's trying to do with psychology something like, you know, Freud is trying to do when he writes about World War I and like the descendant of madness of Europe, or Freud is trying to do in like group psychology. He's, his interest is in, obviously, like, the socio-genesis of mass pathology. It's like questions like authoritarianism, like trying to talk about like a generalized psychological uh, condition. So he treats racism that way, right? And he's not talking about psychology or individual psychological dynamics, except for the case studies that are kind of compendious to the register here. Um, but in talking about history, he draws on it, because after all, what is the vocabulary for talking about, like, the disintegration, the sort of internal disintegration of the dialectic of history? Right? That it didn't just go away, it's just not gone. But the failure of history sort of actively unfolding through its unmastered negative and thus fully disintegrative effects. Right? And that's what he's treating as sort of the noise and drama of the Third World Revolution. The whole Third World Revolution is treated as this vast symptomatic expression of the crisis of history, right? That as symptoms can only point back to an underlying trauma or condition, um, you know, an etiology that they don't sort of self-interpret. Um, that's the way I think his like psychiatric training 
It's amazing when you read the commentators, and it's like, oh, he's a, the guy likes spines, right? And it's like, he's a fucking doctor, right? It, it's the very opposite. Like, he's sworn oaths to do no harm. And, of course, he, so they, they just take these things in, in completely affirmative ways. Whereas what he's really saying is, you know, this is what revolution looks like when it's doomed. It looks like violence, right? It just looks like social disintegration. No questions? Uh, yeah. Um, people of my age have been brought, to, brought up as a matter of course. To I, to I can hear you, but they might. Great. Um, yeah. People of my age have been brought up as a matter of course to read to read Fanon as a as a black nationalist. Um, so I was wondering if you could um, give a specific example of the misreading that the black nationalists made of Fanon's arguments, showing you know why it's a misreading, but also you know what why black nationalists were um, prone to make that mistake, that mis mistaken interpretation. What a nice question. Um, I mean, it's funny that they read The Wretched of the Earth, right? Because The Wretched of the Earth is not about um, metropol the metropolitan situation at all, right? Obviously, like, Algeria is another country, right? Well, maybe that's not entirely obvious. Maybe it could have been part of France. Uh, but the question of independence poses itself, right? And Fanon definitely affirms independence, right? As I, I'm not so sure, you know, I, I don't know what he thought about the departmentalization. Of Martinique, which Césaire, you know, participated in in the literature, is always assumed that he criticizes that departmentalization. Basically, means that like Martinique was turned into like a Hawaii, right? It was made like a part of France, um, even though it's a kind of a you know it, it's a it's a colonial uh, territory, formerly colonial territory, and. You know, it's, so it's just assumed that he affirmed that. I'm not sure that he did. But after 1954, with the Indian coup, this is what I was trying to specify in the talk, uh, with the military defeat of French imperialism in Indochina, and what looks like the valid claim of the FLN to speak for the majority in the French resistance. And there are others who are more interested in some kind of negotiated, renegotiation of the relationship with France. But the FLN demand for independence seems to be, uh, as it were, world historic, expressive of the trend of world history. So when you read The Rich of the Earth, he's all about the Third World Revolution as, of course, an independence struggle, as, of course, there are no allies in Europe. And so, of course, we can't trust the French communists or the French socialists. Just completely takes for that for granted. I gave some of the reasons why he would have taken that for granted. Some of the ways in which the legacy of the particularly the popular front against fascism and the people's war against fascism distorted the positions of the communists, for instance. So that's the book that's taken up by the black nationalists in the United States and, of course, elsewhere. But it's, it has nothing to say directly to the question that had to be, as it were, priorly adjudicated which was, 
that black people represented a separate nationality, right? So you had to be black nationalist before, right? Already assuming that African Americans represent a separate nationality to be able to read the black struggle as an anti-imperial struggle, right? Um, the, the book that, of course, directly addresses the condition of, of black people in the metropolitan world is Black Skin and White Masks. And that's by nowhere, you know, by no stretch of the imagination, as popular as Wretched of the Earth. I don't know the sales figures, but they have to be like a fraction, a small fraction of Wretched of the Earth, which was very good, I think, for a whole generation. Um, Black Sea and White Masks is a group, you know, I, in, in many ways, still my favorite phenomenon book. Um, and I encourage everyone to read Sunit Singh's article in the Platypus Review on that book. Um, there, he's saying quite explicitly, with reference to the United States in the final chapter, that the struggle is for integration. And that the struggle for integration has only been, as it were, broached in America. Right? That in France, you just get people saying, well, you know, we don't care about race. Right? They, they think essentially that the question of race is denied, whereas in the United States, it's integral to the history of the American left, right? And so he has this wonderful image of, he quotes Richard Wright in sort of you know, setting up this passage where he talks about how you know, out of the corp, you know, that he has a kind of vision of the Battle of Gettysburg, or the field of Gettysburg, surrounded by lynched black men and then a rising out of, rising out of the field and the sky is either is a black man and a white man shaking hands. Right? He has this image of the legacy of the Civil War, basically, as being developed within the United States. And in some sense, the United States is where the question of race has been made political and argues that to the extent that the United States is more racist, it's because it's more in the process of overcoming race that it's been made more conscious, as it were, there. Uh, it's been made more, it's been, as it were, thematized as the problem of the revolution in the United States. So that gets, gets completely ignored in the New Left Reception. In fact, you can read you know, books about black skin and white masks where they never talk about them the manifest integrationist, revolutionary integrationist implications of black skin and white masks. I think that, um, like I say, I, you know, not only are you, do you have to be a black nationalist to accept the race of the earth? Like, you know, so, so what's the difference between like reading a book about the third world revolution and reading, um, yeah, in, in reading that book in the United States. In the United States, it, you know, it's basically just read to affirm what I think were, you know, as you know, Huey P. Newton put it, revolutionary suicidal thoughts. Like, let's take up armed struggle against the American state. Right. Things that, that could have you know, more viable strategies in some sense, even though they don't lead beyond themselves uh, in the colonial context, such as armed conflict, uh, make no sense you know, in the first world. And so I think that, that the book is read as a fantasy and as part of an, a wider kind of what I was terming kind of avoidance strategies, like the reading of Fanon is just part of a way of 
pressing Fennell's point about the necessity of the revitalization of socialism in the first world. It becomes part of it, it becomes ritualized, it becomes part of like a revolutionary fantasy. Um, and I think that, of course, it misses the point that I was just making that you know, with respect to Fennel's African readers, that Fennel is saying in 1961, like, yeah, like, I understand we're going to go through this whole revolutionary process. It kind of has this, a logic. Like, you can read, you know, Mao on, like, the logic of the unfolding of peasant revolutionary struggle. That logic of revolutionary struggle in the third world is only ever disintegrative into neo-colonialism, the betrayal by the native bourgeoisie, the need for capital, the way that the peasantry and the lumpen proletariat, which that are at once revolutionary forces, disintegrate into the most reactionary forces. Like when you actually read what he's saying, it's this constant reinforcement of the futility of what has to be, of what it seems that he's faded was fated to be the dynamics of his time, right? And that message, of course, is not read. You know, this is because he doesn't, you know, I, I think it's pretty clear. You know, he'll sort of get to the end of a vast sort of very sort of trumpets blaring, you know, description of revolution and then say, well, you know, we're going to we're gonna have to convince the Europeans to give us some money. You know, he'll say that just like that, and it's just like, you know, just a gut punch if you're reading it seriously. And if you were trying to read it affirmatively, he's like, yeah, yeah, no. Or he'll say, you know, ultimately, you know, the European working class is going to have to stop playing the part of Sleeping Beauty. Right at the end of the On Violence chapter, that's how he ends. Um, Yeah. So I have a question about uh, what, in what sense is Fanon tracking a disintegration of international socialism? And, and what was the vision of international socialism with respect to these issues? But I mean, the, the discussion of third world revolutions is a discussion that's completely conditioned, I think as you said, by the post-war settlement, meaning post-World War II. Like this whole conception of the third world um, right. is determined by the Cold War. Uh, yeah. The Cold War, exactly. Whereas the imagination that the colonial policy and like, how do socialists relate to this is completely different. I mean, the liberal kind of consensus, I mean, there was split, but there's a kind of imagination that Algeria could just become part of France in the late 19th century, right? Um, it's the project. Right. And, you know, there's like a kind of split within liberalism between uh, liberals who kind of want a small nation and England, a little Englandism, um, and the kind of uh, Cecil Rhodes you know, like a kind of uh, social conservatism, uh, white man's burden, etc. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually see the same split within the struggle for socialism. So like you have revisionists on one side who have a kind of a social um, uh, chauvinism. Yeah. You see it as the task of the proletariat as actually kind of civilizing uh, the colonial world. Uh, you also have like Balfour Box, right? Uh, the the right wing social democrat in the uh, Social Democratic Federation in England, who wants a, like a small Englandism and a kind of re retraction from the colonies. And I think oh, is Cosmo not here? Sort of, in the, sort of anticipates Hobson that that Lenin criticizes. Exactly, exactly. Right. I mean, and, and I think like. You know, Kowski's response to 1907 and socialism in 
colonial policy is basically, well, the question is who whom, right? If, if it's the proletariat leading the revolution to socialism, the whole question is going to be completely different. It's not a matter of like forcing uh, production upon the colonial world anymore. Uh, there's a kind of different question. It's a question of how do we make socialism possible. Um, and I think that that gets misread. I think people today, and I think there was like an article in Cosmonaut recently, maybe if a, co a comrade from Cosmonaut's here, they might be able to clarify what they might have meant by this. Um, but I think that the categories of the third world national liberation struggles get projected backwards onto this 19th century history in a way that kind of confuses what's possible today. Because today, I think, it, we also don't live in this kind of third world context. I mean, there's a legacy there, but it's not quite exactly what the situation was in the 1950s. It really isn't. No. So I, I, you know, I'm curious. But can we just say, you know, frankly, nobody gives a shit. Right. Yes. Nobody gives a shit about what happens in Africa or anywhere. Yeah, it, it just isn't in the news. People don't, educated classes don't talk about it anywhere. You're American. I mean, the BBC will kind of still run its occasional sort of, you know, essentially, you know, give money to Oxfam segments, but yeah, that's it. Go ahead. Right. I mean, the, the, like the divestment of the Western European powers from the colonies was actually a, a kind of defeat of, for the colonies. Like, and that's a provocative way of putting it, but you know, the question of you know, why, why was the Algerian War won is because the goal didn't want to put up with it and couldn't, couldn't find the funds. It, it's, not a, it's not really a victory in, this, like, in the sense of a struggle for freedom. It's a kind of continued defeat of the revolution. I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on some of these questions. Right, so, you know, maybe we should have done this together. Um, I, I take that point very sympathetically. What David is talking about is, um, you know, how do we understand, you know, I, I was, I'm just a gesture towards this by saying, look, colonial intellectuals are not just like naive or cowardly before World War I, right? They understood you know, for instance, you know, I gave the example of the of, of the uh, so-called sequoia mutiny of, of 1857. The basic fact of that, which is the largest scale revolt against European imperialism, probably in the history of empire, at least as far as like Asia and African empire are concerned, and it was very retrograde, and it didn't succeed, it's retrograde in the sense that it attracted the support of, of sort of declining aristocratic classes and, and peasants in the interior. That's what drove it. And what doomed it is that it had no support in the colonial cities. The intellectuals there the people who basically gave rise to, who were the grandfathers of the third world intellectuals of the 20th century, you know, from Gandhi to Jomo Kenyatta to you know, whomever, Ben Bella. Um, they write about, when you read them, you know, they write about um, Massini, they write about the revolution of 1848. They want to enter parliament. They do enter parliament, for instance, in Great Britain. They continue to think seriously, in other words, that the liberal project, I can't remember, I think we were talking about my colleague. Lord Macaulay, a sort of semi-degenerate British liberal in the 1830s, very famously wrote, made clear what's sort of the obvious truth of European imperial experience, which is that the proudest day will be when there's no coercive dimension between the, in the relationship between Britain and India. That European imperialism always had, as it were, stamped on it an expiration date. And that expiration date 
was the realization of global cosmopolitan cooperative society. That's the project of imperialism as understood by liberals. It's obviously there in Adam Smith. And every critique of imperialism is from that perspective. After 1848, what's implicit in David's remarks is that this is taken up by the socialist, international socialist movement. And when you read the debates about imperialism, the obvious question is like, well, if we make a revolution here in Europe, won't we inherit, literally, a state that governs other parts of the world? Right? It's an obvious problem, obvious question. Right? And what you see in international socialists, and I think the highest expression is of the, the work that David mentioned, Karl Kautsky's Socialism and Colonial Policy, I think it's from 1907 or something like that. Um, where the assumption is, first of all, there'll be a rapid development in and through the revolutionary process, a deepening of ties to the <coughs> non-West, especially as the, as it were, social basis of the imperial state within the core of capitalism dissolves i.e. as there is an overcoming of the contradictions of bourgeois right, which are what give rise to the state, and thus to the coercive relationship to, you know, that's, that's globally expressed as well as domestically expressed. Um, as that disintegrates, the state will dissolve, but at, the, at a social level, the Resources of cooperation will deepen. So, Kowski gives wonderful discussions of like um, the instances where European Europeans have had contact with hunter and gatherer peoples, where hunter and gatherer peoples adopt practices. And you know, adopt like he basically said, like, look, nobody's ever if there's ever been a time when like Europeans like encounter other people and they say like, hey, we know how to do this thing with nature. We know how we have this technique. We know how to like, you know, make a saw to cut these boards that will like help you with your you know canoe building or something like that. He says, yeah, there's never a time when people aren't interested in that. Like that's never course. People are 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 inter they're curious in like what other people can do in the techniques that they have, right? And that like that's not where the coercion lies. Right? The coercion doesn't lie in you know as the you know retard professors put it, a conflict of culture. Right? It's precisely not culture <laughs> that's interacting. Right? Um, and so. You know, with what Kowski's saying is really an extension of, of what Engels had written on the question, which is, you know, there will not need to be any coercive relationship. People will naturally, do, you know, be attracted to the expansion of the productive forces and socialism. And what he's really talking about is a broader unleashing of what we might call social wealth rooted in cooperation, right? Um, so yeah, the, the goal of imperialism is world socialism for the second international, right? That's the point, right? In, in many ways, decolonization, one of the points I'm trying to make is that, and you, you suggested this as well, decolonization is a way that the first world washes its hands of some of the problems that I was talking about in the middle of my presentation in terms of staggering illiteracy, poverty, etc. Right? 
it becomes a question of like, you know, text 5585, you know, to give 10 pounds to Oxfam, like the posters in the, in, in the, in the tube stations in London, right? Or, you know, UNICEF calls or Christian charity or, or whatever, right? It become, you know, it becomes issues of, you know, international aid between states, right? So in many ways, decolonization is a way of, yeah, it's like a cost-cutting measure. <laughs> it, people really don't understand like how conservative it is and how rare there's actually a struggle over it. Act, you know, like Vietnam and Algeria, these are like remarkable cases, but the overwhelming history is gentlemen's agreements, right? Between, uh, you know, like, you know, I, I think the ultimate example would be India and Pakistan, right? It's essentially a gentleman's agreement with the developed national party, with developed nationalist parties. Like, I think you managed this. You know, we'll still be able to get all the resources that we want to the extent that, it's, and that it was ever about that, that. That's wildly exaggerated as well. Like how economically dependent the first world is on the third world, vastly exaggerated. And you know, whether like the imperial question, whether imperialism can ever be explained as profitable, is like if you're like actually a trained historian of imperialism, as I am, like that question just is a, is a lot harder to answer. Right? And he goes right back to someone like Adam Smith, who's saying this is not an, like, a profitable relationship. This is this is not a beneficial relationship. It's profitable for like the directors of the East India Company, right? But it's massively de detrimental to the entire development of Britain, right? Like that point that's being made there. Right? That this is strengthening an oligarchy that is rendering unrepresentative the most fundamental institutions of the state. Right? Like those effects. Right? Instead, you get this, you know, if you talk to British people today, they'll just either be ignorant or sort of shame faced about the empire. Right? And it's like, look, do you know you're still living with the effects? Right, in terms of the degeneracy and you know unrepresentative character of your own institutions, right? That's right, that, that's what people don't think about, right? Um, similarly, you know, even like the overseas character of it, it's like what are the great benefits for the British ruling class as well as for the French ruling class? It's like it trained a. It, it was a place where you could train military men to coercively treat populations. Those were very valuable skills for the metropolitan situation. Right? When you needed to deputize people to put down the Chartists' petition in presenting of the presentation, the position, presentation of the petition of the of the charter to. Um, Parliament in April 1848, you can deputize all these people who have been in India and have accustomed themselves to, you know, basically pushing people around without, you know, warrant or legality. These are like really nice things to have around. And of course, we've got a lot of that lying around in the United States, right? A lot of just as it were militarism um, that. You know, didn't look like Prussian, didn't look Prussian in France or in England, right? It looked like overseas empire. But it was, you know, it was a real resource for the, for the both parties to stay at home as well. Um, my question was sort of almost a reverse, or a somewhat reversal of David's question. Of the appearance of the World Socialist Movement by the New Left in particular. In that sense, I also want to extend a little bit Tom's question. 
concerning um, the readings of phenomena. And so I'm curious, the sources that you're drawing from, if I can call them sources, and I'll critique that in a moment, seem to me to be Trotsky on the um, World Revolution and Stalin, the critique of Stalinism, Horkheimer and Adorno on the dialectic of enlightenment, and then phenomena. But I think the broader point you're making is that these are really not individual sources, but expressions of orthodox Marxism. And I'm wondering, why does it appear to us, um, specifically, and this can go for, I suppose, any of the readings that I've mentioned, but why does it appear to us that orthodox Marxism is the disintegration of Marxism, is, in a sense, also the, the disintegration of society? Why are these all phenomena that are occurring in what is essentially a unified tradition, which is expressing itself in the same way, just in interacting with different phenomena throughout these, these writings that you're citing. I'm not sure that I'm following in this last train of thought. I'm going to repeat that, please. What is it about these, these writings that you're drawing upon mm -hmm. that gives the appearance that they're separate, that gives the appearance that they're in some ways positive, that they're extens extensions of Marxism? instead of, as you try to characterize, uh, extensions of a negative critique as implicit in Marxism. Okay. Uh, because they're not as clear. You know, uh, the Sartre is not as clear as Adorno. Like, what can I say? Sartre has his moments. He's, the, of course, a giant philosopher of the 20th century whose reputation in his lifetime obviously dwarfed that of Adorno or even Marcuse, um, who was you know, more famous than Marx. Um, you know, Sartre was the most famous philosopher of the 20th century, for sure. Um, more famous than Heidegger. He has a lot of phases, and you know, of course, one thing, you know, if you, as soon as you say, like, proper noun, Sartre, people think it's like a coherent thing, right? It's, it's not really that coherent. Right? There's a lot of writings, they have a lot of preoccupations. You have to have a very deep understanding of history to be able to piece it all together. Uh, what I'm trying to suggest simply is that, um, okay, I mean, there's, a, there's a lot of ways I can take this, but one thing I want to say is that the 1940s are the midnight of the 20th century. And the intellectuals who lived through it couldn't fail to see it. They couldn't, you know, anyone is addressing these questions. The, you know, it's hard for us to imagine, you know, what a decimation World War II was. Um, and, you know, one, you know, and, and people couldn't fail to see that, you know, there was a revolution coming out of that. Right, that there was basically just like, people just basically begging the Americans to help rebuild. That's what it was um, after 1945 in Europe. And in anti Semite, in Jew, and Black Orpheus, and some of the, you know, in the, the writings that Sartre makes of his travels to the United States. Which, of course, you know, the U.S. is sort of exemplifying this question. Right? The question of the future of the revolution is becoming an American question. Right? And there's a lot of disillusionment in, by the way, America between black skin and white masks, where he's pointing to America and the rest of the earth. And that has to do with um, you know, a waning of a sense of potential in the U.S. Um, in the 50s. And I'm not sure the thing almost entirely sound on that. Um, but I think that Mayor Lou Ponty, the, the struggles with the Communist Party over the meaning 
of the liberation of France, which of course they had helped to lead. Right? What does the what does free France mean? I think that Sartre de Beauvoir and Merleau Ponty are thinking about that in super productive ways. And in fact, the French school is very attentive to um, in the period 1945 to about 1951 or two. Just like you can find, um, you know, a lot in, 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 in there, there's a big difference between, you know, Adolf Reed in 1979 and Adolf Reed today. And there's a big difference in like, the moment that someone has an insight, right? Like, at the moment of the failure of the new left, you get someone like Adolf Reed, like writing, like a, the delivering an insight that he cannot maintain. Right? In the same way, if you try to read Sartre as coherent, if you try to read these people as coherent, you're not they're not going to do it. And they're really unsound before the war. Like totally unsound. Especially Sartre. Uh, and De Beauvoir. They're, they're politically um, so that's what I would say is that, you know, there are sort of passages within books that are really fucking great, you know, or maybe there are like enough passages to make it a great book, right? I would say Anti-Semite and Jews is a great book uh, by Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, it's certainly like the most direct and immediate confrontating expression of the Holocaust on the part of a European intellectual. He writes it in 45. Like as soon as you can, like look around and ask yourself what happened to European Jewry. He's asking it. And it's very pointed. Um, let me see this. Am I missing, did I forgotten any part of your question? It's sort of. I, I look at uh, this, that you don't have to be a Trotskyist. Right. Right, you do not have to be a Trotskyist to come up with the, the to have these insights. Like, there's a lot of dissent on the left. There's a vast, you know, it's, it's like asking on a Frankfurt School Trotskyist. It's like, it doesn't fucking matter. Right? They're aware. Right? They're totally aware, and there's a much wider critique of Stalinism than just like Trotskyist. Right? It, Trotskyism is a, is a crystallization of a vast discontent. Right? It's a very precious distillation of that discontent with communism. But these people are not members of parties, so they're picking up the critique and they're, and they're articulating it in their own way. Go ahead. I, I, I guess my point is. Not so much that this is a, there's a discontinuity between the, the works that you're citing, but more so why does it appear that there's a discontinuity between the works you're citing? So I and you sort of just answered it by pointing out that it doesn't matter if the Frankfurt School is Trotskyist. It doesn't matter if Trotsky reads Adorno. The coherence of Lenin comes from the party and the struggle for socialism. That's why all of his works have a coherence. Without that. There's no mechanism for accumulating historical experience. That's what Spencer is saying about the 20th century. Right. We're talking about isolated intellectuals, yeah. obviously. Um, we're talking about people who are not members of a organized struggle for working class struggle for socialism that commands the assent of large numbers of people, and in that sense has world historic stakes involved. These not that kind of intellectuals. Like these are philosophers, these are people who write books like The Second Sex, right? Um, really good books uh, that make points that people can't fucking deal with. Like, you know, women need, need to join the universal brotherhood of man, right? Like, these are statements that they, like, they all the same thing. People can't fucking deal with, right? But their memories and echoes and course, ultimately critical expressions of the crisis of European socialism, or you know, by which I don't exclude North America, right? The socialism that had its core in Europe. 
Another round of applause for Simpson. So our next and final panel this weekend's conference will be here, What is the Critique of Capitalism? That will be at 4.30. Um, be there, be square. Thanks. And if you're interested, if you're interested in more topics and conversation like these, I would strongly encourage you to attend our reading group Tuesdays at 6 p.m. and our coffee breaks Wednesday at 2 p.m.